So, uh, Anna, thanks so much for sitting down with us. So I guess this is a long, sordid story. Let's kind of start at the beginning. How did this come about? So, as you know, right now I'm running for Florida's 13th Congressional District. I ran in this seat last cycle, and I was the primary nominee. Um, I was, you know, fortunate enough to have the support of over 200,000 people within the district, which I'm very, very happy about. Um, but again, for this seat, it's reannounced, so we don't know what the lines are going to look like. So back in May, I actually ended up reannouncing my candidacy, and. I would say maybe shortly thereafter, we started, or actually I started receiving some kind of comments from people within activist circles in Pinellas County that are involved within the GOP movement, um, that there was this William Braddock character who was making really, really nasty and really aggressive comments about me. And then a couple of people said, you know, he's talking about wanting to run against you, which I try not to let it bother me, but as time progressed, I started getting concerned because it's one thing to you know, say you're gonna run against someone. Obviously in politics, people can get nasty, but in my experience, and we'll get into that in a second, there's a huge difference between someone that's making you know, these aggressive and violent comments versus someone that's just saying, I, you know, I'm interested in politics, I'm gonna be running. Um, so I started so you, so you, so you, other people were telling yes. you this guy is making comments about yes. you. Yes, and at that point in time, again, like I try not to let it get to me. Mm -hmm. But I started getting concerned and I started getting concerned because again those comments were aggressive they were really nasty and for me kind of with my background and my experience you know <laughs> I've gone through a lot and I've been able to identify when people are being threatening and not and I take all of that very seriously you know I was involved in an armed robbery at nine years old I survived it by the time I was in high school I'd actually been near fatal gang shooting on my high school campus. You know, by the, I, I had a cousin that was murdered. And then by the time I was actually a young adult after I joined the military, I had a home invasion. So this is something that I take extremely seriously. Um, so I was keeping an eye on it. And I remember telling my husband, hey, like just so you know, like there's this guy and you know, it, it was making me uncomfortable. It wasn't though until about midnight right after, I think two days before I filed the police report that, or a day, no, sorry, messed that up. It was midnight on the day that I filed the police report that I actually got a phone call from Aaron and Aaron said, you need to call the cops. Um, this William Braddock character is going to murder you. So let's back up there. You had already filed a police report before no. the phone call? No, oh, no, okay. I got the phone call and then at, right after that is when I called the cops. Okay. So you'd been hearing these comments and then Aaron, and what's your relationship with Aaron? So Aaron was someone who I knew loosely within kind of local politics, but how I actually met Aaron was this year at CPAC was the first time I'd actually like had an interaction with her and she was actually dating at the time my friend Rogan. So I met her once, but then they shortly thereafter broke up mm -hmm. and it's not that, you know, I wasn't close or anything, but you know. Right. The night of June 9th, Aaron calls you. Correct. And what did she say? She literally said, you need to call the cops. I just got off the phone with William Braddock. He's going to murder you. And I think that at that point in time, I mean, like I didn't hear the phone call and I was like, wait, what do you mean? You're freaking me out. And then she kind of explained, she was actually really shaken up. She was on the phone, like pretty disturbed by it. And at that point in time, I called the cops. How did you feel? Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to like obviously get emotional talking about it, but it's horrifying. <laughs> How are you supposed to feel about something, something like that? Over politics. For whatever motivation. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Take your time. We were talking about obviously how upsetting it was to get that phone call. Yeah. Um, what, what would you, I mean, did you have any interaction or relationship with William Braddock? Why would he feel that way about you so strongly? No, and that's what was really disturbing is that I had never had any interaction with him prior. I, maybe one time he introduced himself to me leading up to that, but I didn't personally know him other than that. So, this obviously caused you a lot of concern, and you immediately did what? I called the cops. Okay. And I filed a police report immediately, and it was a really long night. 
Um, I was probably with law enforcement officers to maybe three or four o'clock in the morning because I had to explain step by step everything about interactions, how I heard about him, and basically hand over evidence. When you got into politics, you, you must not have thought that it would ever be a matter of life and death, right? I mean, I mean, you hear about this type of stuff in, I think, you know, TV shows, but you never expect it to happen to you. And especially given the circumstance of, you know, how he was just talking so nonchalantly about it, like a who, what, what, when, where, why plot and how he was going to murder me. It's pretty horrifying. Yeah. Uh, so uh, tell me what happened after that. It, there, somehow Amanda Mackey, one of your former uh, opponents, and I guess a current opponent now, and another man named Matt Tito became involved. How did that happen? Yes, that was actually per statements made by William Braddock and actually on the phone call that, you know, all of these things that were written in the actual police or police report and then also to the filing for the protective order were something that I had to outline because of the fact of what Braddock had stated specifically in the phone call and in various text messages to other people. And William Braddock himself stated in that phone call that he was working with Amanda Mackey and Matt Tito to take me out. And for context, these are people that he himself said that I never once made that and I had to turn over the evidence for law enforcement to be able to do their job. I never publicly posted that. I never publicly went to the press to say that. That is something, and those statements were made by William Braddock himself and also posted online by William Braddock. And so let's clarify that. So the involvement of Mackey and Tito into po any possibility of being alleged to have some sort of Connection. animus against you is coming solely from Braddock, not from other sources with direct information. Solely from Braddock, correct. Those were statements made by Braddock. And actually, he's made also, even after all of this has happened, after I think the first court hearing, he, I think, spoke to WFLA 8. And to the reporter, he told the reporter that he speaks with them once a week. And I think that that's important to note because I've never said that you know, they were, this is all just me reporting this to law enforcement. I never made this public. I never did any press statements. You know, William Braddock posted the injunction filing to social media. Mm -hmm. He went to the press. I did not. And so I think that it's really important for people to know that because there is evidence and that evidence will come out in court on September 14th when hopefully we will have a permanent injunction against William Braddock. And I'm not going to let it intimidate me, but I think it's important for people to know those facts and that everything that I wrote in that injunction or request for the protection order is backed by evidence. Right. And again, and that evidence is coming from Braddock. Correct. So there's not, it's these, these questioning or these, uh, these comments that you were getting about Braddock making, uh, making certain threats against you, all of the Mackey and Tito involvement comes through him. There's nothing coming elsewhere. Comes through him, correct. Okay. And he made these comments to not just Aaron, but also multiple people from within the community. Mm -hmm. And, and he did talk to me. Uh, and that was me. I did that oh, interview okay. with so him, you, and, and we talked. And, and he stood in front of me and said... Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, the door's ahead. open. Yeah. And Please. said um, that it wasn't him. And that, you know, that, that you know, wouldn't, wouldn't commit to him, it, it being him on the tape. Did that frustrate you when you saw that? Um, I mean, I don't know how you could... I mean, I don't know how you could say something like that and then also speak to multiple people and then turn around and lie about it. Uh, Mackie says that um, her attorney has apparently reached out to your attorney demanding all the evidence showing how she was involved, and if not, then retract and apologize her involvement. They said that your counsel has never responded. Mackie says that, uh, that you've effectively dragged her through the mud here. Can you address those comments? Yes, actually, our attorneys did respond, and they know that that entire thing is completely false. You know, it's interesting for context to note that um, Mackie and Tito both are talking about running for Florida 13. And I find it very interesting that instead of condemning what Braddock has said and done about them, I've never said that. In fact, I've never come out into the press to make any of those statements, that they're refusing to do that. And I find it interesting because... From Braddock's own statements, he was talking to them weekly and he was meeting with them. And so for me, he's saying that they're cozy. Why is it that they're going to protect him? And I believe that they are not choosing to condemn him because they know exactly about the fact that they had 
coordination with him. Whether or not it was about me and whether to what extent it might have been, I can't say. But I also can't hand over evidence from an ongoing investigation. And again, I've never gone and publicly made statements to say. I'm just simply saying what Braddock, William Braddock said himself and that that's all backed by evidence. In other words, you're saying why are they mad at you for things that Braddock said? We're talking about someone that's like literally talking about murdering me. Who, what, what, when, where, why, how he's going to do it. And yet I'm the person that is the bad guy here. I can tell you that hands down, if this happened to someone that I was running against, I would absolutely say I have no involvement and I hope that that person is okay. That's I think any normal person's response. Why is it that they haven't done that? And I do believe that at a certain point, if they did have any contact with him, that they are more concerned about that contact than actually coming forward saying like, hey, look, this is not right. This should not be happening. And we do have proof of that correspondence as well that we did send a letter back to her attorneys. Are you upset that the state attorney is not going to pursue charges here against Braddock? Well, I don't agree with his decision, but ultimately that's you know something that the laws give to him to decide. However, I will say that there's an ongoing federal investigation that's involving the DOJ and the FBI. And I think that all of those facts and all of the evidence will come out at the appropriate time and we have to go from there. I'm doing everything I can to completely comply with investigators and hand over whatever evidence I have. So that was my next question is how is that affecting the federal case? Have you have they told you whether or not they are considering? They charges? are. They're taking it very seriously because you have multiple aspects of this now. I think you have, you know, har a harassment angle. You have obviously a murder threat, which I think is important. This is not just, you know, people like to say it's just, oh, it's just a, a threat to kill you. No, it's a murder threat. And I take this very seriously. I mean, think about where I came from. Think about how I can identify. This is absolutely horrifying. And you know, ultimately the investigators and the prosecutors of which I've spoken to all of them, they're also taking this seriously. And so I think that that's going to be important for people to say, hey, pay attention to the evidence. Most of what I'm telling you about now is going to be available for people to see themselves in court in September. And I think that it's very dangerous for people to make assumptions and listen to the rumor mill when in actuality, they have no idea what's going on internally. They have no idea about what we see. Well, you know, there's text messages as well. And so I just hope- From Braddock. From Braddock. And I think that it's going to be important for people to focus on that and just honestly, like follow what the investigation is saying. Can you characterize them in any way? I don't think I can fully get into them, but what I can tell you is that the, the DOJ and the FBI and the federal investigation is being taken very seriously. I just want to talk about the race. We're a year and a half out and all this has already happened, I think a lot of people might say, man, this, this might not even be worth it. Is it still worth it to you? For me, yes. I think a lot of people, you know, look at the situation and as horrifying as it is, I think that, you know, when you're fighting for something that you tr truly believe in, I think that you have to just accept that it's a, it's a possibility. And ultimately for me, I think if people could just take a step back and realize that there are you know, regardless of whether or not people disagree, everyone's trying to promote what's best for the country. And I think part of what we saw in the last election cycle, even with President Trump, is that, you know, you do have good and bad reporters. You do have good and bad candidates, I think, on all sides. Mm -hmm. And I think about it, it's important for people before they make any decisions, especially on stuff like this, especially given that it is such a, a sensitive topic and also to there's, you know, I'm not just a headline. This is my life and I take it very seriously. So yes, I, I'm going to keep fighting because I told the people back in November and my supporters, I wasn't going anywhere that this is just the beginning. And so with that, I'm pushing forward. I've always had this ability to adapt and overcome odd circumstances. And I think that that's part of my story, but hopefully sharing my story um, will enable, enable other people as well that might be victims of similar circumstances to just let them know it's okay, you can get through it. You know, this is obviously uh, a fever pitched battle already. Do you, what do you think is gonna make the difference in this race? and who gets the Republican nomination. I mean, first of all, we're, what you just said about everyone wants the betterment of the country, they might just be going about it different ways. You often hear that when people talk about different solutions on opposite sides of the political aisle. But th this was a candidate who's on your side. 
Yeah, and that's something that I think you, I, I never expected something like this to come from within my own party, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't think that that is a fair representation of Republicans. I think that this person is, is very angry. I think that they're disturbed. And I think that you know people can sometimes lose focus of the bigger picture, which is if you're running for Congress, you're ultimately running to represent the voices of the people in the district, right? You're fighting for them in Washington, D.C. I, I think that a lot of times also, you know, if people are this desperate, I mean, power corrupts, that's something that we all know, and it's a very true statement, and I think it isn't more true today than it ever was before. Um, but I will also say that, you know, with what I'm hoping to do and what I'm hoping to accomplish, um, this I'm hoping that I can put behind me. And I do anticipate that in September, on September 14th, we will have a permanent protective order against William Braddock, mm -hmm. and we will be campaigning in, you know, from now until then moving forward, and, and hopefully it'll be something that people can see the evidence of. What I think will set me apart is that I've always been very honest and people know that, and I've never been the one to make a statement without having evidence to back it up. Last question for you. Mackie announced yesterday that she is gonna run against you. She finished second to you in that Republican primary yes. last year. Um, so she presumably would be your biggest competition, at least thus far in this race. State Representative Chris Latvala endorsed her at the rally and called you a phony who previously supported Barack Obama. How do you respond to that? I think it's interesting because he also said that I was lying about the Braddock threats. And I think that it's really interesting that Lotvalo and both Mackey would act and behave like that, but ultimately it's not up to them. And regardless of who he endorses, it doesn't really matter because it's the people that decide, not them. Anna, thank you very much for taking the time out today. I know this was emotional for you. I appreciate it. Thank you.